Charlie, Yancy, 400 and 800 metres and current state performance coordinator and coach at the TIS. Thanks, Susan. Ruby Smee, 1500 metres, 3K, 5K cross country runner. Um, Australian rep twice in the Oceania Games and most recently the International Schools Cross Country in France in April. Welcome, Ruby. Uh, next to Ruby, we've got Matt. Australian Athletics Team Physio for the last eight years and also prior to that he had six years with um, the team of Great Britain and he's also the Director of All Care Physio here in Hobart. Um, we also welcome Pip Ng, um, sports doctor in Hobart, has worked with many sport teams at state and national level, currently working in Hobart alongside Dr Steve Reid and Dave Humphreys. And um, last but by no means least, Harvey at the end there, welcome Harvey, national junior medalist over the steeple and 3K. All right. First question, Pip, if I can um, direct this one to you. Can you perhaps give us a definition to start off with um, of bone stress related injuries? What it actually means? So pretty much bone stress is an imbalance between how much our bones can tolerate and what loads they can, they can use. So our bones are constantly being broken down and, re and, um, and reloaded. So we've got this balance between how much our bones can use and how much <coughs> they need. So. A bone stress is when we're doing too much what our bones can handle, and that usually, in that sense, is going to be too much running base loading sort of thing. So it's when our bone can't tolerate how much we're doing for it. Um, how frequently do you see these types of um, injuries um, in athletes, and is there a most common area of the body in which they affect? I, I see these quite a few a week. I'd say five or six stress injuries a week, um, and that's amongst a lot of different sports. So mostly they are weight-bearing based sports, so running, footy, soccer, those types of things, but can also be in other sports as well. Um, they can affect all areas of the body, but most frequently it's going to be lower limb sort of injuries, so feet, um, shins, hips, those types of things. And I think when we start to look at these types of injuries, we sort of classify them into the ones that really, really worry us and the ones that are a bit less concerning. And the ones that worry us a lot more are some of the ones in the feet, so things like an ambiculous stress injury, which some people might have heard of before, um, or a base of the toes, or a base of a metatarsal one can be quite challenging too. Um, the ones in the tibia, so the front of the shin, can also be quite challenging to get on top of, and as can some of the ones in the hip as well. So they're called femoral neck stress fractures. So they're sort of the ones that usually light up a little bit more and make us a little bit more concerned that these are going to take really quite a bit of time to settle down. But they're really common injuries. Um, and unfortunately, they're things that can take a long time to really settle down. So getting on top of them early is probably the most important thing with those. Thank you. Um, and stress reaction versus stress fracture. Yeah. Is there a difference? There is a difference. It really is a continuum. So a stress fracture is when we actually go and break the bone and get a sort of a split in it. A stress fracture is sort of that, sorry, a stress reaction is that precursor to the fracture. So that's when we start to get that increase in the load, but it's sort of a bit of a warning <coughs> sign to getting that stress fracture. So it's one of the ones where if we can catch the stress reaction, I take a big deep breath and go, we can, we can save this one from getting to the really disastrous stage. But it is just that continuum of where we sit on that line. And sometimes it's difficult to determine if it's gone all the way through or not as well. But it is, um, you'd be much happier with a stress reaction than a fracture. <laughs> That probably adds my next question because it was going to be around the diagnosis yeah. of how you diagnose you know, either one, one or the other yeah. um, and the length of time um, for recovery. Yeah, good question. I guess it depends a little bit about whereabouts that fracture is as well. So the first line investigation normally is going to be something like a plain x-ray um, and that's going to show us if there's a crack in it. But at the same time, if there's only a tiny little crack or there's only that stress reaction, a lot of the time that x-ray is going to be pretty normal, which can sometimes confuse people a little bit. And that's when we usually go down that MRI pathway. So the MRI is the big 3D scanner that's essentially a giant magnet. And what that's going to be able to show us is when there's increased bony uptake, so those stress reactions before they become fractures. So that can be a really powerful thing to try and identify these before they go and actually break all the way through. There's other types of imaging we can do for certain things, things like CT scans, which are 3D x-rays. But again, we try to avoid those unless we really need to. There's a bit more radiation with those things as well. But usually, anyone's a bit worried, the first line thing is going to be an X-ray. If that's normal, we're still pretty suspicious. Then we'd probably go down that MRI pathway as the next line. Is there a general time frame for recovery, depending on a stress reaction versus stress fracture? Um, depends a little bit on the area of the bone that it is. Usually, it's going to be a minimum of sort of six weeks of doing not a whole lot. Um, and if that's a stress reaction or fracture, sometimes it's not that dissimilar uh, to start with. And then it's that reassessment. So most of the time, if somebody comes in with a stress reaction, it's going to be sort of four to six weeks of not doing a whole lot of 
weight bearing, and depending where that is, if it's in your navicular or in your foot, you're on crutches, no two questions asked. Whereas it's set in other places, sometimes we can still let you walk with it, but just take out the running. Um, and then usually it's having another look, it's a four to six week mark, and pending that, can we sort of start to get you moving again? And the ideal thing is to get you back into doing something as soon as we can. A lot of the times we can still do some things on the bike or in the pool, so it's not a blatant no-no. Um, but usually that time of no running is how long it's going to take you to get back into the running. So if it's six weeks of no running, it's going to take at least six weeks to reload you back up. So these can be quite long injuries, unfortunately. But in terms of the time frame, it really is dependent on whereabouts the injury is. It makes a bit of a difference. But six weeks is a good starting marker, I think. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Matt, if I can come to you. Um, in athletics, could you give us an idea of um, if there are any events that are at higher risk than others and why? Yeah, the, the, the biggest prevalence we would see are in the, the endurance running groups. So, um, you know, so middle distance going up to um, to obviously the longer endurance events. Um, you know, the caveat to that is it doesn't mean we don't see these in sprinters and power athletes. Um, we, we certainly do. Um, the throwing group, excluding javelin, probably less so. Uh, Jade might want to talk about um, pole vault at some stage and <coughs> javelin as well, both of which are slightly different because of the mechanics of those events and um, some of the spinal things that um, potentially they get, so some of the the um, spinal stress ranges, but otherwise it's absolutely the running groups. Um, the prevalence is probably slightly higher in women than it is in, in men, uh, it's probably slightly higher in younger developing athletes as well. But if you're in a, an endurance based event, um, then you're in one of those groups or a, or a high risk group. Okay, um, is there any evidence as to why you know the more prevalence in females than males? <coughs> Yes, um, so there's a few different reasons behind it. The biggest thing really is energy availability. So the reason that we get a bony stress is our bones can't tolerate the loads that we're giving them and that can come from, as Matt would talk about, so doing too much training or it also can come from not eating enough food or having some hormonal imbalances and those types of things as well. So the big reason for women is the fact that we all get our periods and we menstruate, thus we need more energy to do those types of things. So it really is trying to get that balance between those two things right. Um, that's probably the most likely likely cause behind it. Thank you. Um, Matt, um, without breaking any patient confidentiality, it's just a question around um, perhaps some of the well-known um, Aussie athletes who have um, had these experiences um, over the last couple of years and how they've handled the setbacks. Yeah. Um, so I understand sensitivities to, to speaking about particular athletes. Um, I'll leave these three things sitting here. So these are just off runners tribe if anybody's interested. So there's uh, an article about Melissa Duncan, an article about Genevieve Lacays, and there is an article about Josh Harris as well. Um, there probably are, I would suspect, many international senior Olympic middle distance endurance runners in Australia um, who probably haven't had at least a boat stress reaction at some stage. The majority of them have had stress factor at some stage, I suspect. It's a little bit like anybody who follows cricket, then, you know. There probably aren't too many international cricket first bowlers who haven't had a back stress fracture at some stage. So that doesn't normalise it in the sense that we should think this is trivial and everybody has one, but they are in that endurance group, they are they are really prevalent. I think if for anybody who wants to take the time to read through through these briefly, and place some things we're going to talk about later. So Melissa Duncan um, qualified for Rio in 1500 metres. Uh, fantastic and had, had run really well, developed a, a stress fracture in the foot about 12 weeks out from Rio. So um, she was you know, off that foot for six weeks, sort of time scale, and then there was a decision made to roll the dice, see if we can get it going, and it didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work out. So she missed the Olympics, she ended up having surgery, she didn't run for another 12 months at least, and she's still we on the comeback trail now, we're talking about the 2016 Olympics. Um, Genevieve Lacays, who is publicly known to have multiples, not just one that's talked about in, in this article. So her 2016 season was you know, a fantastic season. Um, you know, ninth in the Olympics in the steeplechase, Australian records, pretty much ran at BB every time she went on the track in 2016, and then in 2017 broke down with a stressy. Um, and Josh, and you know, obviously it's too local to, to talk about that you know, too much, but it's worth reading uh, 
you know, Josh's thoughts that, you know, he's in the public domain that Josh knew that he had a stress fracture um, and went on the starting line in the World Championships with that on the basis that this might be the only time I ever get to do this. Um, you know, but the consequences have obviously been really significant um, and that's taken, you know, a long, long, long time. Um, you know, and he gives his thoughts on that. So I guess the message out of that is that, you know, we talk about high risk, people talk about high risk and low risk stress fractures again. You know, these are things that have really significant impacts on, you know, people's athletics careers. You know, so somebody who's missed out on Olympics, somebody who rolls a dice to run in the World Championships, so he can say he's running the World Championships, you know, but will will certainly have an impact for the rest of his running career, presumably. Um, somebody else off the back of a, a fantastic year where they're ready to, to take on the world and really try and become a top eight, you know, runner in the world, you know, who has broken down again, you know, for an extended period of time. So really common. Um, the last one that I'll mention, just to take it out of the endurance world as well. So from my time in the UK, there was a an athlete who for another year we've heard of called Abby Yepita. Abby finished fifth in the 200 metres, so a sprint event in um, the Athens Olympics in 2004. It's quite a young athlete, ready to to take on the world and progress to you know potentially to sort of medal level. Um, Abby had and was undiagnosed for quite a while um, a stress fracture in the front of her tibia, which Pip's talked about. These they are higher risk, um, and so both in terms of the recovery time for that, which involved surgery, and then all the subsequent injuries that she got as part of that getting back into running. So that's part of the consequence of this as well, that you might recover from the stress fracture, but you know, then starting to have other problems on the way back. So that was 2004, her Olympics. She didn't make a senior team at a World, at a world Championship, so again until 2011. And she was in the relay squad and didn't run. And then she did get to run in London. She ran in 100, under 200 in the London Olympics. So that's 2004 to 2012, really, before she got to run again at that level. That's a hell of a long time. It's a long, long time. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's, we spend most of our time not trying to be scary when you see patients. But, <coughs> yeah, it's worth knowing that these are not trivial things. And for people to overcome them, we still talk about it. I know you both got off lightly. Um, you know, you've really got to be pretty committed to what you want to do sometimes. I think Pip kind of alluded to this, but in terms of your risk factors around, you know, these bone stress injuries. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we can, we can, these days we can, we can sort of put them into to three buckets of things. So we can talk about those things that are just bone health risk factors and, and they're the things that, that Pip's talked about. Um, Historically, we've always talked about biomechanics and the way that you move and you know the, your running form and all those sorts of things and you know things like pole vault, javelin. You know that's particularly relevant for some of those spinal things. Um, the most of the research and evidence uh, these days suggests that biomechanics probably isn't the crucial factor that, that we thought it was. That training load um, combined with bone health and it's that balance that is that is the uh, the biggest risk factor. So, if I can just for you know two minutes at most talk about training load and what we what we mean by that. So, training load effectively is everything that you do in terms of loading that bone or or the rest of your body. Um, we typically these days break it down into being the combination of how much you do and also the intensity of what you do. So, if you uh, if you run 50 kilometres a week. Um, but you then suddenly increase the intensity of three sessions a week out of that, then you've increased your training load. If you keep the intensity the same, but you go from 50 kilometres a week to 70 kilometres a week, you have increased your training load. So it's a product of both of those things. Um, and what we know, and that there's a temptation to think that, that you know, people like Pim and I are constantly saying people train too much, people train too much. It's not necessarily the case at all. So what we know is that you actually need to train enough, that training is protective for your body um, you know, AFL football are, are really good examples of this because they, because they have their athletes and they do nothing else, they can record all sorts of things. And so most of the clubs know that if their players don't do a certain amount of training during pre-season, then they're more likely to get injured during the season. So training is protective and is good. We know the same about people who are running because it's Hobart, lots of people, you know, trail run. So I will see people who you know, who want to go for a 40 kilometre run every second weekend and do no other running. 
Yeah. They don't do enough running. Yeah. They need to do more running to be better able to do their 40 kilometre run. So you need to be able to do enough training for it to be protective for your event. We also know that there is a top end as well and that there's only so much that people can, can tolerate. Um, but the big thing that we know is that the variations between that bottom and top level should be pretty gentle. Yeah, so it seems to be the some changes in how much people do that become the big risk factors. Not necessarily on the day um, of that session that you're doing. You know, that might be delayed and that might be a few weeks later that all of a sudden things start to appear. So the message is you do need to train enough. You can overtrain and the changes need to be gradual but between that. The difficulty and the challenge for coaches is that what that minimum level is, is really individual. And because three people in your squad can run 80 kilometres a week, it doesn't mean that the fourth person can sustain 80 kilometres a week. And because your coach, who was a really successful athlete, this is a comment, um, <laughs> because your coach was a really successful athlete and had a model of just running loads and loads and loads, it doesn't mean... That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't mean, and so that's the coach's successful model, it doesn't mean that that translates to every athlete in that group. It doesn't mean if your coach's model was, I didn't have to do much volume, but I could train really hard every single time I trained, that doesn't translate it to every athlete either. So we know that you need to do enough training, but we know it's really individual where that threshold sits. And there's a little bit of trial and error finding out where that is. The other thing to, to keep in mind in terms of where that minimum level of training is, and I'll not talk about you in a little bit later, it might take you a while to build up to get to that point. Yeah, so if, you know, if the, and this is all a bit abstract, but if we think you need to do enough training for it to be protective, that doesn't mean that you can sit out, and start running and go in two weeks' time, that's how much I'm going to do. Yeah? That might take not just weeks or months, but that might take a couple of years to get to that point where you're able to train enough that it's really protective to your body. Awesome, thank you. Harvey, we'll go to you. Um, two years ago, um, you started with shin problems during your track season, which affected your results on the track. Um, over the last 12 months, you've had a relatively injury-free year. Can you talk us through um, what you and your coach did differently in the last 12 months? So just a bit of background, uh, a few years ago I've had multiple stress reactions, lucky enough not to get a stress fracture as such, and that occurred due to overtraining. Um, there was one, like my first ever stress reaction was when I accidentally doubled the session and did 24 laps of the track instead of 12 laps at 1500 metre pace. Um, so yeah, the next day, um, just completely out, uh, <laughs> that didn't go well. and. Um, I'll talk about this more, like the emotional and psychological side of this with Ruby later. But um, it's you just a lot of the other ones, a lot of the other stress reactions that happened after that were due to wanting to just get back on the track, and um, just the the pressure that comes with it, and looking at your competition, they're going really well, and you see where you're at, and uh, you're not going so well, and there's a big competition coming up, you just want to get on the track, and going into it too early is. Uh, a huge danger and it's only going to hurt you more than do what's best for you. Um, so in terms of why I think I got the stress reactions, uh, apart from overtraining, there's also other things. Um, I have very tight carbs and uh, as Peter would know, <laughs> yes, and Matt, and I get, my, I think my score is four centimetres on the <coughs> knee to wall. Um, so there's a lot of pressure going through the calves and the shins and uh, combined with overtraining and not doing your load properly, that caused a lot of problems. So what Susan and I have done differently in the last 12 months is, as Matt said before, just progressively getting that load. Uh, and that was done through training peaks where I would wear a heart rate monitor every session. Uh, it would record your intensity and with my Garmin, your duration. And that would give you a TSS score and uh, training peaks would monitor that over the time and you'd monitor uh, the increase in load, whether it was too high or too low, and if it was the session was too hard or too easy, because it's really hard to predict um, the intensity of a training session and how much you increase over time. So training peaks was, was really good for that. I would highly recommend 
um, doing something similar. I don't know if there's any other similar apps. There probably are. There probably, there probably are. Um, and another thing as well was uh, strengthening over time. So along with really tight calves, those that had really weak calves, I could only do about 20 calf raises. Um, and every night before bed, you just do a few calf exercises, like stretching exercises and strengthening exercises. It's just a simple calf raise. It only takes three minutes. And you do that three minutes uh, every night before bed, and your calves uh, really strengthen, and that helped really increase the uh, my ability to increase load without soreness. I'd also get really sore as well after trainings, uh, so the increase in strength helped with the soreness, and also magnesium as well. Uh, Matt can tell you a bit more about magnesium. Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so basically, like, well, magnesium it helps with mass muscle contractions, and I found that it was really helping with the soreness uh, after sessions. And recently, the day I ran out of magnesium and I didn't have time to get more, and I was, um, you know, continuing my training, I was noticing I was getting really sore afterwards, and I was wondering why. I was like, oh, okay, well, I haven't been taking my magnesium, got straight back onto it, and I was fine. I'm not saying that's going to help for everyone. But uh, I would definitely recommend it. Um, it's all good with Asada, depending on the brand, if you want to check that. But most of the time, it's all good. Thank you. Matt, have you got anything to add to Harvey's answer there in terms of. No, I think Harvey's. Yep. Sorry, two things that, that you know, it's really the process you going through, but that you understand that process is really good as well. So you're not passive in that, that you, know, that you can explain why like that is really impressive. Um, the other thing, you know, for me, like to sort of what I was talking about here as well, is that you know the other thing that's happened there is you know you're a couple of years older now than you were when that happened. You've been through a couple of training cycles, and I guess that's the message that you know your body, you know, we're great because our body adapts to what we do. We're not like a car. You know, if you drive a car, your car only ever wears out; it never gets stronger. You know, we're different. We can get stronger over a period of time and more resilient, um, and our bone health can become better, and all those sorts of things. But it takes time, and you know, for now, lots of young athletes here as well. Don't be in a rush. That may well take a few years, and getting through a few training cycles where there are a few little ups and downs, you know, on the way through. But being patient, accepting for the coaches that that might take a couple of years to be getting to that point where you're training enough to both be resilient and perform at the level you want is probably a really normal thing. Yes, Susan. Um, in the squad, you've had a few athletes in the last season who have suffered from um, bone stress-related injuries. Um, can you highlight some of the factors that contributed towards them? I think some of the factors have already been <coughs> highlighted here and that I work mostly with um, middle distance, long distance athletes, so I'm right in the pocket of high risk. <laughs> and, and not only that, I work with teenagers and a lot of athletes who have gone through puberty. They have a totally different body coming out of it and they're almost learning how to run again. So we've got a, we've got a, a high risk squad essentially, um, and that 16, 17 year age group is typically where we have to be extremely careful. Um, there's a possibility with low energy with the girls, as I said, having gone through puberty, that they're starting to watch their weight as well. So that there is a possibility that that may be affecting them. Um, I have some who are probably like Harvey um, have had weaknesses that we've had to identify and work really closely with Matt with and that's that's an ongoing process but they're at a higher risk than some of the other athletes. Um, Sartus in September is a real problem because that is not good timing for us. You know you're coming out of uh, my guys finish their season in in March they have typically have a month off there might be some running, adjusting back in. We actually adjust quite well in the squad back into full training, but then it's only a few months and bang, starts is on. When I say starters, it's there are three competitions that are all on the track. You've got your school's starters, or the school's individual one to select their team, then you've got southern starters, then you've got state starters. Now, this is, it's important for my athletes to compete in those because they're a star in their school, this is their time to shine, and I recognise that, however, um, we, there's quite a bit of discussion, isn't there, Harvey, at that time as to how many events that they can safely do at that time when they're still kind of in winter training. Um, and it is really tough on their bodies. And I do think that's probably what affected Harvey, you know, a couple of years ago. We've learned from that as well as to how to balance that. 
Um, I, I'm hoping science at some point may change their, their times to have it later on or, or even in first term. I've heard rumours of that. That would be very helpful for us. Um, again, just athletes' own goals as well. So uh, taking all of that into account, an athlete such as Ruby had a goal to make the Australian team for the cross country and seeing as though she was already in the top six in that age group, that's a realistic goal. Uh, and her competitors would have been aiming for that. So that's something that I wanted, wanted to help Ruby achieve and I knew that she could do that. However, it meant that we had to step the load up a little bit. And we, we really never had an injury at that point, so I was pretty safe, you know, to go for that. But it did become a problem. However, <laughs> she made the team. She ran well then. She got an injury. We worked through it. She, it was a good learning experience for Ruby. She learned a lot about herself, and she'll talk about that, you know, very soon. Um, so it wasn't a negative thing, I feel, getting that injury at that point. Um, Disappointing because the performances could have been better, but she's still very young. She's got a long way to go. She made that team and it was a really good experience for Ruby to go away on that and I hope that that will motivate her in the future. And, and just a stress as well. So stress of that age group, particularly going through year 11 and 12. You know, that's a tough time and stress definitely has an impact on how you train and how your body recovers. Cool. Um, I suppose an addendum to that is, have you changed anything to address some of those issues back in the last year? I think I've got a number going through year 11 and 12 this year as well. So I'm really conscious of their overall load. Not just the load, how many Ks they're doing, but what consists of their week, what is going through their heads, how they are dealing with that, how they are coping with that. So this is not a period to, to up the load considerably. Um, on the track, so and, and that can be that can be quite hard for athletes to understand. They want to they want to train more than they did the year before, which is fair enough. However, they've got a huge load on, and they don't quite get that. That that requires really good communication skills, um, good education, which is partly what the TTP is about as well, um, and a good relationship between the coach and the athlete as well. So you can work through that together to come to an understanding that this is where you have to be at this moment because this is safe and I want to see you running well when year, when year 12 is over. We'll increase it gradually, but we both need to be monitoring how you're coping with that. Um, we've introduced some runs on the track in gym time. So Jack Lifton takes most of my athletes for gym on Wednesday. Jack and I spoke about this, particularly with Sardis in mind. We need to get them on the track a little bit more earlier. Um, but not very much. So they're still doing their main track sessions Tuesday, Thursday, or not track sessions, we do them on the grass and they're mostly intervals during that time, hills perhaps on a Tuesday. But somehow we need to get them on the track a little bit to get their, their legs and their feet and everything ready for a little bit more once we come further down here. So we're, we're, we're trying some run-throughs and we'll see how that goes. It's a balance, it's tricky, and we've got to try it, it might not work, but you've got to, you've got to try it. Um, also, we're doing, we're being really careful with plyos. Some people would know that plyos can have a big impact on improved performance, but where on earth do you put it in a heavily loaded, you know, year 11 and 12 program and where you're trying to increase their load in their running anyway. So that's a really tricky one. So what I'm doing at the moment is we're um, doing little pogos on a, it's on a Thursday before training as part of the warm ups and little pogos, which are totally fine. But then they're jumping onto a box. So no landing on the grounds with their players at all. We're only jumping on box. We've been working up from three sets of three, up to three sets of five. Now we'll get to three sets of six. Worked with the strength coach to design this and specifically when we put that in is quite vital. And so far, really, really happy with how the athletes are pulling up. They're getting no soreness from that at all and they're not affected in their session or afterwards. So really happy with that one. Okay, thanks. Ruby, um, Susan's spoken a little bit about your injury that you had, um, was your first major one last year. Yep, can you describe the injury for us? Um, so I got a stress fracture in the sesamoid bone in my foot, which is the big padding bit just below the big toe. And there's two bones and the, there was a crack found through an MRI in a, was it October? October last year. Um, and yeah, I would say it was my, like I really wanted to make that cross country team 
and I would admit that it was lack of communication with Susan because I remember um, with me and Nathan talking about it in the car like a few weeks before that national... Like you're blaming Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always blame Nathan. Um, but a few weeks before the cross country race, the national cross country race, I, I think I said to him like, oh, there's a bit of pain in my foot. But I don't think I actually communicated that to Susan. Don't know why. Um, and as Harvey said, it's just that pressure that you want to, you want to keep training. You don't like, you don't want to tell your coach because she'll reduce the load and reduce load. You think means that you won't be able to perform as well. And I was just so desperate to make that team, and I did. Yeah, I made the team and. I remember after that, I was just in really good form, and I was just, I just felt like invincible, and I was like, oh, I'm keeping up with the boys at training, like, <coughs> I'm so good, and then the pain, I think you went away as well, and yeah, then right. that's also the lack of the miscommunication, like, I didn't think, the pain was never really bad, so I didn't really think, oh, I need to message Susan about this bit of pain in my foot, it's just, as a runner, sometimes you just have to... Yeah, you just have niggles that you put up with, so yeah, it did escalate to a, a moon boot for a month. Oh, that, that was going to be my next question yeah. about the type of rehab you did and what, what, yeah. where it went to, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think for about two weeks I was on, on the bike and then when we finally got the MRI, I went to Matt and put me in a moon boot, so it was <laughs> nice of him. And then, I was in the pool for about a month every day in the pool with Nathan and my other training partner Beck. So that was selfishly quite good cool that I had them to train with in the pool every day. And then, yeah, Susan was very good about keeping me fit for and progressively loading back up to be ready for all schools in December. That's good. Can you, would there be a typical week, like in the rehab phase, what would a typical week look like in terms of pool sessions versus you're saying to keep you fit? What would a typical week look um, like? I might just step in there. Yeah, please, go ahead. When they're injured, I train, I coach them train them harder. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, than I do if they're not injured, so they don't want to get injured. Um, so I, I might let Ruby go into it, but yeah, they're, they're dripping with sweat on the bike when they're on the bike, and they are working hard in the pool, and they are not wanting to do full sessions. So it's not easy being injured, and there's absolutely no reason not to train, because it's always something you can do. Go for it, Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we just hate pool sessions in our squad. Like, it's just a bit of a punishment. Um, there's one called the 30 second killer. Yeah, that's Susan's name for it. And I think that's 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, six times. And then that's a, you do that six times all up, I think. So we do, we would do things like, yeah, water running reps and then, um, like swimming reps, like four by 100 metres on a 10 second recovery, like killed me so bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was a week would be quite a few of those kind of reps in the pool and then like a Wednesday would be just a 30 minute easy swim or something like that. Cool. Thank you. Um, obviously, you know, we've had a couple of the athletes talk about the psychological aspect and it's obviously a really trying time. So, Susan, just from a coach's perspective, the mental health of athlete and coach are important during all of this. Um, what strategies do you employ for the athletes and yourself to maintain a positive psychological state during this trying time? <laughs> Um, I'll just say that when an athlete gets injured, I take it very personally and I may not show that to my athletes or they might they now know my secret, um, but I do take it personally and I, that's probably something that I had to deal with in that. No, no, it's not actually all my responsibility because the coaches do take that on. There's no coach that I know of that does go out there purposely to hurt their athletes. We do absolutely everything we possibly can to get it right and for our athletes to be able to fulfil their goals, which does mean pushing them and testing them, and that's part of our job to balance that and get that right. But none of us know everything about that athlete. Everyone's an individual, everyone responds slightly differently, so it's it's really hard work getting it right for each person. Um, and I put a lot of time in, and my athletes would know that with, with their individual programs that we have to mix and match and try and get it right. So it's a very trying time for the coach, 
Um, uh, I think a strong focus in, in my squad is that we are actively taking, discussing and reminding each other about injury prevention strategies. And so that's, that's one of the things that I use as well, that I, I know that I'm trying to give the best education to my athletes um, to try and prevent injuries. It doesn't always prevent them, but we, can, we, we do what we can. Um, I ask my athletes to let me know if there is pain, but as you can see, that's complicated as well. If an athlete's never had an injury before, and Trudy had, and she doesn't really know <laughs> what the pain is, how do you know that this is something that I need to take further and get it checked out? So uh, you can say that, you need to let me know and I will stop you, and my athletes are sometimes scared that I will stop them because they want to keep going, but um, that is, that's an understanding that, that you have, and, and after they've had the first injury, they're more aware of, okay, this isn't quite right, this is undue pain, it's not just a niggle. I'll discuss it with the coach, let's go to the physio, let's get it checked out. Um, I probably do focus on gratitude, so really grateful that I have other athletes in the squad at the time who are going really well, even though Ruby might be in the pool, you know, <laughs> but you know, there are some athletes in the squad who are going gangbusters, and that's, that's terrific, so I'm getting it right with that athlete. I'm not getting, I have a big squad, probably the, I probably coach more athletes, um, you know, at a reasonable level than any other coach on the track, so um, I'm not gonna get it right with all those athletes ever, all the time. So I do need to focus on the things that I'm personally as a coach doing quite well too. I recognise, and Matt's brought that up as well, that all athletes get injured, and we, they have some of the best coaches in the world. So, so that's something to focus on too, that it's part of the process of being an athlete and we just, we don't get it right all the time as coaches. Did you, as an athlete, have any bone stress injuries? I competed from 14 years of age through to 32, had a couple of years out due to injury, but I never once <laughs> had a pain stress injury. Um, however, <laughs> I had plenty of injury problems with my back and I had Achilles tendonitis quite severely in the last couple of years. So no, never had a stress reaction, never had a stress fracture. That wasn't due to, I, probably, I just wasn't probably in as much of those risk categories. Uh, and I had different body types that responded to different things. But I can tell you now that I had some pretty severe injuries which you know, I, had, I didn't get a PB there for seven years. So I had my own problems with injuries, just not bone stress related. Okay. Can I really quickly jump in? Yeah. So, um, so Susan's giving you know, a really nice sort of account of what she does with athletes who are injured and that, that relationship almost becomes closer and lots of self-examining and lots of support. Um, my experience is that that's not always the case. In fact, it's quite frequently not the case. And I think when athletes, and I guess this is back to coaches, that when athletes are injured, um, you know, athletes talk when they come to see physios and people like us, it's often a real period where a fault line develops between an athlete and a coach. And quite often, you know, and this is at absolute elite levels as well, it goes across sports, but certainly in track and field elite levels, it becomes a period where the athlete often feels really abandoned by the coach because they don't hear from the coach as frequently as they used to. You know, they used to hear from the coach every day or every second day or something like that. You know, how's training going, how are you going? But they hear nothing about you know, what you're doing when you're away for two weeks rehabbing. There seems to be no contact. You know, you know, and it's really frequent that, that I come across athletes who say, I haven't heard from the coach for two or three weeks. But I think it's quite often because the coach just doesn't know what to do with this athlete. Um, so what I would really throw out as a challenge to the coaches in the room uh, that if you have athletes who are injured, that's when they need you far more than when they're in the final warm-up track before they go to a, a state championship or a national championship. And if you can't be a really good coach when your athletes are injured, then you will fail that athlete. So a real challenge to the coaches not to abandon your athletes. And if you don't know what to do, you know, there's enough experience in this room, all around this room, to go and seek out the opinions of other coaches or whether it's professionals or whoever it might be to make sure that your athletes feel supported during that period of time because it's not a universal experience that all athletes have. That's probably a really nice segue into my next question for both Harvey and Ruby. Just in terms of how you both felt psychologically during the time of your injuries. Okay, uh, I'll kick us off then. Um, so psychologically during the injuries, I think we've already covered this uh, briefly, but as Ruby said before, 
you just really want to get back onto the track and you really want to, um, you don't want to decrease your performance level because you're going really well at the moment and you, you see your other competition, you have goals in mind and you really want to meet, reach those goals. And you have the feeling that if you, uh, if you go into rehab, then you won't reach your goals because you're not running or you're not training as hard as you might. But I'd just like to say that that's completely not true at all. Uh, there was, uh, all my stress fractures have been right before competitions. Um, I remember in all schools in uh, Canberra, uh, I was injured for two weeks. Uh, I was injured for two months and I only came back into it two weeks ago and came to Canberra. Uh, I couldn't do the steeplechase due to the, the extra load on the shins. So I did the 3K and I just went into the competition but not really caring about what happened because, you know, uh, I've done just bike sessions and pool sessions for two months and haven't run. And that, that's really hard because you know that you've, you've trained all like these years and put so much effort into it and the big moment comes and you're not ready for it. But in the end, I actually ran a 12 second PB and uh, the timeout didn't really affect my performance at all. And if anything, it increased it uh, because during the rehab, there was, we were still keeping the aerobic base up, but also other muscles were being worked that you wouldn't normally use while training. And because of that, Susan and I actually incorporated more, unfortunately, more bike sessions into, our, uh, into my training. And I think that's actually helped. So that's, that's a positive out of that. Uh, in terms of more psychological, uh, it, it's hard uh, to see your component, uh, your competitors training so well. Uh, just remember looking at MJ's stories and <laughs> seeing him train really hard. Uh, and you just, it's uh, quite, you just, constant negative thoughts, I think. Like, I, I'm not ready, I can't do this. Uh, will I ever come back from this? How, this, what does this mean for my future? Uh, and I think really just having that connection with your coach uh, to work it out and to get a good rehab program going in terms of bike, uh, elliptical, swimming, whatever it may be, uh, to ensure that you keep your fitness, uh, you won't go downhill. And I think it's really good uh, to come, as we were saying before, to identify it early. So it's a stress reaction, not a stress fracture. And we were saying before as well that you might not know whether it's a stress fracture or not because you've never felt that before. And you, you would normally try and hide from your coach because you don't want to uh, go into rehab because I think Australians just have this constant attitude of, oh, she'll be right, you know, it'll just go away the next day. It's only a little niggle. But uh, if it's been there for a while, I, you have to seriously uh, look at yourself and go, all right, well, this isn't actually doing me any good. Uh, if I'm training like this with constant pain, it's not so bad having a couple of weeks off. And it might only be a couple of weeks at the most if you get onto it early. Uh, and that's better than missing a whole month off. And that two weeks isn't gonna do anything to you because you've got the rehab. So there's a few like tips. Um, How do you mental definitely? I was laughing. Well, the, the, day, the night that um, that gave me my moon boot. I had a bit of a cry, <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, I was pretty devastated about it. And then I felt a bit better. And then Susan sends through the next month of training and another cry. <laughs> oh God, just every day in the pool. So after the initial <coughs> negative thoughts, as Harvey said, it was about a week I was just really upset. And I think that was the week I was in the pool by myself. But Honestly, once our Nathan and Beck joined me, just having that community squad environment, training with you every day, like I think I started to embrace it a bit more. And um, like coming into the all schools race in December last year, I think I, I like I was actually very quite confident, and I was I just remember thinking like I want I'm gonna get top three, I'm gonna get top three, and that's probably a thought that I wouldn't imagine having when I first got told I was put in the moon boot. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, and yeah, big, big thanks to Susan and Matt for getting me there. But like, honestly, I just can't believe how well your pool sessions and that just <laughs> progression back up to me being able to run that race worked because I did manage to get a silver medal and do a sub 10 minute 3K, which 
was oh, like crossing that finish line. I just felt so emotional because I just didn't ever think that that would happen. And yeah, it was just good. I'll just chip in there as well. I, I can certainly relate to how an athlete feels when they get an injury. I spend a lot of time in the pool myself. I know how boring it can be. I really try and link other people up as much to their annoyance at times if they're not injured, but you know, to join if there are any injured athletes in the pool because it makes a big difference. You need that. For me, the squad environment is really, really important, having a great culture, someone to bounce ideas off, to talk, keeps your mind off all the negative thoughts. So you've got to keep that going and that contact with the coach and with the athlete when they're injured is really important and, and trying to link them up somehow so they're still part of the squad. And I always keep them going with the gym sessions as well so that they're, they're still catching up with the squad. In the gym. Even if there's not a great deal they can do for the social interaction, that's really important. And something we probably didn't add in is uh, I don't think these two needed it, but if, if they do need, um, if they are getting more depressed or more anxious or something, then we can always call in a sports psychologist as well, and they're fantastic to use. So you've got to get the right one for you, but they're definitely, um, definitely a support service that we should utilise. Thank you. Um, Pole vaulters aren't immune to this. If I can uh, deflect to James Fitzpatrick, pole vault coach, um, just in terms of you recently went to a national round table regarding stress fractures in pole vaulters. Um, could you be able to outline a little bit of um, what was discussed there and some of the outcomes? Yeah, so um, we decided to have a, a round table in March last year because we noticed that across the country we had quite a number of really talented junior athletes, especially uh, coming in with lumbar stress fractures. And typically the model that is pretty much employed across Australia tends to be the one that, uh, in terms of technical model, which in theory shouldn't be producing means. We don't tend to follow a, a different model that they oftentimes in other countries, which is supposedly related to back injuries as well. So um, we got together to discuss, we're obviously a very different cohort to the, the distance runners and the, the loads. Different ours is more of a jumping load and how many contacts and jumps that go through the lumbar spine in that area as well. Um, I think most of it's been covered here, which is all pretty much the same. So um, we looked at um, technical factors and we came at it from the point of view that some technical factors will um, interact with the load. Okay, so that's probably where we came at it from. So some of our technical aspects will, unfortunately, if we're not paying attention to them, have the potential to increase every jump, the load that goes through that lumbar spine. So I suppose that was the interaction between the, the biomechanics and the load component as well. We also looked at total jump load for these athletes, and we looked at the age groups that they were in when they were coming up with these things, and they were predominantly at the earlier age, very talented, early young jumpers as well. Uh, we looked at um, bone mineralisation as well, which was really important because we discussed that uh, uh, even though athletes, as they develop, they're developing their body dimensions, are developing physically, and they look big tall and strong, the actual bone mineralisation in that area and on the spine especially is lagging behind um, what, they, what they look like, if you like. So that means we can't train a junior athlete the same as we can an older athlete as well. So um, we then went on for that to try and identify some things we could build into the TTP um, to get some consistency to be aware of this across the board um, and to try and build in that. So we've now got a national curriculum, yeah, yeah. so it highlights what, what each event coach um, needs to be focusing on prioritising, so that's what James is referring to in the TTP for TTP coaches. Yeah, so we, we tried to build that in, so everyone's singing from the same song sheet across the country in terms of what's being provided. Uh, for the athletes um, in terms of a, a technical model which reduces the load and also um, information regarding uh, those sort of concepts for, those, for the uh, younger athletes especially. I think we also touched on the fact that um, it's always, and this is probably a little bit different to the actual um, idea of the, the stress fractures and reactions, but it is relevant because we very much in Australia have a model that is very much um, performance base as a junior that goes through, you reach these performances, you're on this pathway. Um, and juniors do feel this need to produce these results 
Otherwise, they know when they're slipping off the pathway, okay? Whereas all our other evidence says that we really should be looking at a macro and a micro cycle, a macro over years. We know it takes more than a decade to develop jumpers at, at high level senior performance as well. And like most other sort of track and field events in Australia, we have this issue of producing very good juniors, but then getting a lot of dropouts sort of at that sort of late junior level not going on as well. Okay. So I think we, we had some discussion around that and trying to get more of a, a base up, keep these young juniors, talented juniors, uh, injury free through that period so then we can develop them further later on. And that may mean sacrificing you know, overall performance levels early on so we can actually get those performances later. Awesome. Thank you, James, thank you. Um, look, I'm just mindful of time um, and allowing questions. Um, so if I can just, um, Pip and Matt, if you would, just in terms of summarising perhaps some of the discussion here today, if there were three main take-home points for people um, in terms of prevention of these types of injuries, what would your pearls of wisdom be? Um, I think the first one is reporting things early, which I think both Ruby and Harvey have highlighted on as well. But if something doesn't feel right, it's sometimes hard to know if you've never had an injury before, but just put your hand up and ask someone. First step's always your coach. Um, they're the ones who see you all the time, but then probably popping in to see someone like Matt or myself to further have a look at it. Sometimes it is absolutely nothing, and it's to take a deep breath, it's going to be okay, and that's the best case scenario. And being able to catch these before, as we sort of said, before they become a really big problem is the most important thing. but. Just telling somebody if something doesn't feel quite right is probably the first thing. Um, the second one I'd probably say is that overall load that we've spoken about a lot. That's the biggest risk factor to getting these bony stress injuries. And the tricky thing is load isn't only what you're doing on the track with your squad, but also the fact that you're playing soccer at school or running around every day at lunchtime. But all those things contribute to that overall load. And although your coach has a lot of control over what you can do when you're at training, they don't always know everything else that happens. So you've got to take a little bit of autonomy as an athlete to realise where all those bits of the load come into the puzzle. And the fact that you're doing that extra running external to what you've been told to do comes into that as well. So just being mindful that you need to know exactly what you're doing and just communicating that with the person who's writing your programs, I think, um, is a really big one. Um, I'll go, I'll go number three. Um, and it, and it, for me, it ties lots of these things together. And you know, James's notion about you know understanding that lose lots of athletes because you know talented young juniors, and this happens in every sport. It's not just just track and field. Um, and we have bizarre things that happen that we have kids who are training more than national senior teams. Anybody play hockey? You're stupid. Um, <laughs> um, so. The thing that comes out for me then is making smart decisions at the right time. So I can understand Melissa Duncan wanting to roll the dice to go to an Olympic Games and do something that was probably a bit of a risk, but that's okay. I can actually get, because he's come out and said it, I can understand Josh Harris saying, I would rather not, I would rather not finish than not start in what could be my only world championship. And I think I know the consequences of what that means. <coughs> if it or not, I don't know. But, so I can understand people in those moments of those making those decisions. If you're 16 and it's, I've got to compete in my school athletics carnival this weekend or not, that's a really, really different decision to make. As much as people feel pressure and you all feel pressure to compete and all feel pressure of the pathway and all those sorts of things, making smart decisions you know, that are appropriate for you at the time, for your age, for what might be your injury, I reckon is a really important part of this. We're talking about recovery and bone stress. How much of an interaction is there in terms of um, illegal um, performance enhancing drug use and the ability to sustain high loads? Um, I guess I guess the one big thing for that is don't take anything unless you're 100% sure it's okay and everything you put into your body has the potential to come up as an adverse drug reaction. So that's my one big overall thing to start with, um, be very careful about taking anything. In terms of illicit substances and how they impact on bone health, certainly that anabolic steroid point of view and those types of things are not fantastic for our bone health and can lead to those stress-based injuries. So there's not really anything that's going to be enhancing bone health from an illicit point of view, so there's no good reason to go down that pathway. Um, things that can help bone recovery in terms of vitamins, minerals, those sort of things, the big thing is probably vitamin D would be the one thing that I'd probably suggest is a worthwhile 
addition. That's not an illicit thing by any stretch, but that is something that in Tassie comes from the sun. Winter, we get not enough of it. You've got to be outside for about three hours a day with shorts and t-shirt on in winter, which I don't know many people who do that. Um, if you are, you're a little bit crazy. So um, from a bone health point of view, getting in shots in the front. Um, getting, having, a, having a chat with your doctor about vitamin D levels and those sort of things can be probably the one important thing I'd put on there. The other thing is probably calcium based things, but again, we should be able to get that through our nutrition alone as opposed to needing supplements. So my opinion in most of these things is I like, I like to avoid supplements as much as we can because there is that inadvertent risk of taking something that isn't 100% pure. And although we can batch test and make things as clean as we can make them, we're never 100% sure. And my advice to all my athletes is don't do anything unless you've spoken to a dietitian and a doctor about it. Protein powders, all those sort of things have the potential to give you an adverse drug reaction. So again, trying to get things through food and those sort of things are better, but yeah, didn't quite answer your question perfectly. But overall, I'd be <laughs> suggesting against taking Oh no, I was just but wondering in terms of uh, other countries where we were, they're, a little bit, they're stringent. Mm. Are they having, uh, do we know any stats on sort of yeah. bone reaction and bone stress injuries for those guys that are clearly on a, a, a drug program? Like yeah. are they, are they yeah. sustaining high loads because of that? Well, they, we know they can sustain higher training loads uh, across the board. Um, and. Yeah, for better or worse, having some experience of athletes who have come back from those environments and, and trained and um, it's no so knowing an athlete who you know was banned for a period of time and then came back as a clean athlete um, and was really clear that he just could not sustain this, the, the same training loads at all, couldn't, couldn't get close to it. And so, um, yeah, and so one of the challenges then happens when we get coaches coming out of countries that are you know, not living by the same rules that we do, but bringing the same training programs as well. And if you're a clean athlete, you cannot sustain those, those training programs and there's a high attrition rate. Um, so, you know, so we know athletes can sustain higher training lines, more frequent training lines is probably the, the big part out of that. Um, I think those athletes at some point still break down. Yeah. I don't know how that relates in terms of stats around bone, yeah. bone injuries. But they get super tendons. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to have their bones when they're yeah. sustaining yeah. that yeah. injury. So. Another question down the back? Is there any association with iron deficiency and stress fractures? Is there any Not. It's not directly correlated, but I think a lot of the time that iron deficiency can be a sign of not having enough nutrition in, so I think, although it's not a direct correlation between iron and bone health, a lot of the time having low iron is a sign that we're just not getting that energy input, which becomes a risk factor, if that makes sense. So I think that's a really good identifying sign that we need to be looking at that full dietary intake and how that seesaw sort of balances out. Um, so I'm just curious, so a lot of you've talked about the way that training intensity of it peaks, sort of steps up a little bit, that can be a real risk as well. But a lot of training seems to me to be sort of um, almost in waves. So it'll, it'll also sort of have little slower periods as well, less periods of less intensity for, for a week or so. So I just wonder about your thoughts on when, when things start being down. Yep. Is that sort of... Yep, so something. I struggle to talk without being able to write sometimes, so I start <laughs> doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So something that gets talked about a lot now is the acute to chronic ratio of, of training loads. And so the way that that's calculated is that your chronic training load, and so it's still like a relatively short cycle. So over four weeks, if you quantified your training load and took an average of that over four weeks, that's considered your chronic training load. So that's sort of what your body is used to for that period. So if you, and you know, it becomes a bit of a numbers game, but if you drop, um, below 0.8 of that or above 1.3 of that in a week. So, um, you know, you start getting in and then come back up the following week. Your, the stats tell us across a whole heap of sports that you're at increased risk of injury or, or illness for the following four weeks. Yeah, so it's, so those weekly changes seem to be enough to change that. Now, um, that becomes relevant when you talk about dropping off as well. So if you miss a week because you're ill, if you miss a week because you've got exams or because your family goes on holiday, then you decrease your chronic training load a little bit and you come back into your squad and you're immediately joining with everybody else and do the same thing. 
that week off is actually probably enough to have just subtly made a change. It doesn't mean you are going to get injured, but you're starting to get into the, the risk area because all of a sudden you're having quite a big jump up the next week to come back. So it's really challenging to, to look at where they, you know, what's happening from week to week basis. And the other thing that happens, particularly for younger athletes, is that you do things that aren't just training. So if you are Mo Farah, everybody knows, in his, you know, his coach knows exactly what he does because he doesn't do anything else. That's all he does. He doesn't go to school, he doesn't run around at lunchtime, he doesn't do PE, he doesn't do fitness extended, he doesn't maybe play another sport. You know, so there's a real challenge that your training load isn't just what you do when you come on to training, it's all those other things that potentially influence that as well. But it's the change of week to week and having big changes um, that seem to be really, really important for that. Yeah, it does. I'm just smiling. I'm just loving the idea of both hour of running around at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody catching the play yet. Who gets stress reactions or fractures? When you get through that six week period, do you ever re scan to compare feet, legs, mean, like to see if like, it's back to where it's the opposite side? The opposite side has a small reaction or something that may be having no issues to them and have another scan on the injured one that's frankly now fine after six weeks but they're still getting pain, do you do that? Or you just go, after six, eight weeks you can hop, you can jump, just go run? Usually I go clinically to be honest. I think a lot of the time the imaging results lag behind how you go. So if I scanned your, your leg which had a bit of bony edema through the front of your shin, even though you're feeling a lot better, signs that can linger for months and months and months. So it depends on where the fracture is and what it is. Most of the time, if you can hop, jump, feel pretty good, you know, pretty much pain free, I'm pretty comfortable to go by how you're going clinically. Occasionally, with these high risk ones, we do re scan them just to reassure ourselves, if nothing else. But I like to avoid re scanning unless we need to. Again, it's expensive. Um, if we need to do it, we need to do it. Some of them have a bit of radiation, and again, we don't want to do that unless we really need to. So. Comparing side to side, don't really ever do that, but occasionally we will rescan. But if everything's going to plan and it's ticking all those boxes, I'd much rather let you tick those boxes. When we stop ticking the things that we need to tick, that's when you might consider doing another photo, really. Oh, come on, finish off. Oh, there's another one. Sorry, go ahead. Have there been studies done on false positives of stress reactions on MRIs? As in, how many healthy athletes? Yes. Yeah. Yes, if you went and took um, a group of highly trained endurance runners and did MRIs of their feet, probably the pelvis as well, there are studies that do that, you will find increased signal which suggests bone stress. So part of the, the difficulty is that we don't jump in, but, and sorry about the language a little bit, so physiological is a normal adaptation to something, so a physiological change we consider to be healthy, pathological is when we think things are going wrong. So we're not 100% sure of the distinction between those physiological and pathological changes on MRI with some of those bone stress things in people who don't have pain. So, and it comes back to Nathan's question, so there has to be a marrying together of the clinical presentation along with the imaging findings. So you would never take a group of, you would never take Susan's squad and say once a year we're going to do MRIs of their feet. If we see any hot spots, then they have to stop running. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yep. So yes, there are false positives. We're having this debate in cricket at the moment. I work with cricket Taz, but overall Cricket Australia is saying, do we scan every fast bowlers back at the end of the year and the start of the season and see if there's any increase in that bony edema because we know that when they get stress fractures in their back as you would see with Stark Cummins all those guys they lose 12 months so do we scan them and have a look and if they're there do we then pull them out just in case but then you have that again that debate of sometimes that little bit of bony stress is just that normal adaptation to it so it's a really it's a tricky one but overall I certainly am not for token screening just because as we said because we'll find things we know we'll find things probably it's a really good question the other thing for athletes as well, when we're talking about early reporting of, of injuries, um, you know, and that fear that people are going to tell you to stop running and do, do things like that. You know, people like Pip and I don't take any satisfaction out of telling people to stop trading, and we don't do it just on a whim because we understand how important it is to people. You know, the reason that we advise people to stop is because these are actually nightmare stories of people who haven't you know, being able to run for 12 months, two years, 
eight years to get back to running at the same level. So, you know, we are on your side um, and we want you to perform really well. So we're not looking for excuses to scan, to stop, to be overly cautious, to do things, you know, we're trying to be really appropriate and give you the best advice that we can, you know, for your health and so you can perform really well as well. Is there one more? Sorry, we've got time for one more question. Sorry, there was a fellow with his hand up. Um, what about less invasive scans like ops uh, sounds like electric beds and like um, MRIs? And... Um, MRIs are, in terms of radiation, they've got zero radiation as well. So you've got your ultrasound and your MRI, which are both really safe because they're pretty non invasive. Then you've got your x rays and your CTs, which have a bit of radiation. So Ultrasounds, unfortunately, aren't great at looking at bones. Occasionally, you can see a little bit of stuff, but they're not that sensitive. So from my point of view, from a conservative point of view, that's why MRIs are so good, because they're, they're radiation-free. The downfall is availability. It can take a, sometimes a week or so to get, in, get a scan, and also you've got to pay for them. That's probably the only downfall. But from my point of view, I think an MRI is a really safe scan because of that lack of radiation. Thank you, I'm sorry, there's probably a couple of questions that we didn't get to. Perhaps there's an opportunity just quickly afterwards, but I know there's another session we're in front over. So thank you very much. Let's put our hands together and thank everyone.